Hey guys, I'm Ruby. Today's video is the final video in the small series of The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker. If you haven't seen the first two videos, you should go back in the psychology playlist and watch those two. Today is part three, The Dilemmas of Heroism. So without further ado, let's get right into the video. One of the greatest riddles that has plagued mankind has always been the question of what life ought to be. There doesn't seem to be a definitive answer to this question. Great men have risen up throughout history and attempted to pin down this elusive answer to what an ideal life is. Certain philosophies rise up for a time but as time goes on, they fall out of favor and are replaced with new ones. One thing that is certain is if one is really to live an ideal life, then that life must be truly transcendent. Soren Kierkegaard called this type of person the Knight of Faith. This figure is someone who lives in faith, has given the meaning to his life over to a creator. He accepts whatever happens in life without complaint fulfills his duties in life, faces death without a qualm. This means that they must be above all the petty things that most people concern themselves with, and they must have the courage to take on any task no matter how frightening. This beautiful and challenging ideal is contained in all religions in one form or another. In more psychological terms, it is the picture of perfect mental health. Kierkegaard's faith-centered ideal creates a stark contrast to the more science-centered ideal of agnostic men like Sigmund Freud. Freud created a system of thought completely devoted to the problems of this world, but had little to say concerning things not of this world such as the realm of faith and spirituality. Both the religious view and the scientific view have their pitfalls. In the case of science, it perhaps offers some solutions to our worldly problems and thus allows us to better embrace life, but in the absence of extreme inspiration and talent, as is the case for most people, it lacks an outlet in which one can transcend death and overcome the anxieties caused by it. In the case of religion, it gives one the ability to transcend the death fear with faith, but the solutions it offers for earthly problems are much less clear. If one were to turn over everything and lean on God, how could they simultaneously stand on their own as passionate human beings? And so on one hand we can't escape the death problem, and on the other we are left with the life problem. Men like William James saw the solution as living in both of these worlds at once. This, however, is not easy as one tends to pull you away from the other. One of James's favorite sayings was, Son of man, stand upon your own feet so that I may speak with you. In his opinion, faith in something higher was necessary but in order to accomplish anything, one must first contend with the world before looking to something higher. Regardless of what approach we take, these heroic strivings we attempt are made so difficult because in order to achieve this coveted heroic immortality, we must overcome the very nature of our character. This seems to be impossible for most people. Goethe said, that man cannot get rid of his nature even if he throws it away. This is why men like Norman Brown miss the whole point in his book, Life Against Death. In his Freudian view, all of humankind's problems can be boiled down to repress guilt and shame caused by bodily issues stemming from infantile sexuality. His solution is to live an unrepressed life by teaching that this infantile sexuality is normal and we should celebrate our bodies and embrace our sexuality, thus overcoming the shame and guilt at the root of all of our anxieties. 
The biggest problem with this theory is guilt is not the result of infantile fantasy, but rather it stems from self-conscious adult reality. It's our own human nature that causes this guilt. Embracing our human nature is the issue, not the solution. In order to overcome this guilt caused by our humanness, one would have to transcend humanness itself and become something akin to a god. Anyone who puts forth the idea of an unrepressed existence as a cure-all has seriously misunderstood human nature. The need to repress the fear of death runs much deeper than any guilt that may be caused by our cultural or ideological beliefs. Try as we may to arrange life in a way in which will lessen our guilt and fear, we are sure to fall short. For it is life itself with all its attendant horrors that is at the core of our dilemma, and it is life itself that makes repression necessary to have any kind of semblance of a meaningful life. Even religion as a purely ideological solution falls short of solving this problem. In the words of the American sociologist Philip Reif, abstractions will never do. God terms have to be exemplified. Men crave their principles incarnate in enactable characters, actual selective mediators between themselves and the polytheism of experience. This means there is no cookie cutter solution. It's not a matter of converting to the right religion or adopting the right set of ideological beliefs. Our solution does not lie in the creation of some kind of utopia where we can all live in peace and harmony. Our hope lies within the human struggle itself. It is only there, in the trenches of life, amidst the despair and the struggle to survive that we can truly come face to face with our human limitations. And it is only once we have been forced by necessity to stare these horrifying limitations in the face that we can fearlessly and heroically transcend them. And it is this heroic transcendence that gives life meaning. Nothing worthwhile comes easy. The irony of life is that the process of finding meaning in life by heroically transcending our human limitations seems to take a lifetime. By the time most people have found this meaning, they are in the later part of their lives when their decaying bodies are already starting to fail them. This is perhaps one of the reasons that psychotherapy is so popular in today's day and age. With the guidance of a therapist, we hope to achieve this meaningful transcendence much earlier in life while we still have time to fully enjoy the anxiety and guilt-free existence that would come about as a result. But despite all the therapy available and all the self-help gurus out there that offer joy and awakening, at the end of the day, all they really offer is self-knowledge. Self-knowledge can be very helpful when it comes to dealing with many problems and neuroses that can develop in life, but it doesn't solve the life problem itself. For that, we would still need some kind of symbolic immortality. Even Sigmund Freud, the founder of talk-based therapy said, he cured the miseries of the neurotic only to open him up to the normal misery of life. In order for something like psychology to fully solve the life problem by offering the path to symbolic immortality, it would have to become something akin to a religion. First and foremost, talking and belief are not enough as we discussed earlier. People need to embody their beliefs and act them out if they are to really be transformative. The therapy session would have to turn into something closer to a ritual where the therapist helps the patient act out the inner workings of their mind. On top of all this, psychological terms would have to take on a metaphysical meaning and the therapists themselves would become something like a guru. Short of turning psychology into religion of its own, the solution may perhaps be to use psychology as the bridge between the agnostic scientific view of men like Freud and the metaphysical spiritual view that religion offers. In this sense, religion and psychology would work together symbiotically. 
Psychology allows one to strip away all the layers of social influence, defense mechanisms, repressions, and neuroses until they are left with the essence of their nature. It is only once we achieve the ability to truly see the fundamental problem in life and stare our aloneness in the face that we can then hope to fully understand the solution that spiritual belief offers. Only by fully understanding the void deep within us can we truly justify our belief in some kind of metaphysical power from beyond to fill that void. We are left with the choice of being left trembling and alone in the aftermath of the psychological revelation of our smallness or to try and connect with the cosmic process in the form of a god or spiritual teaching and become part of something bigger. Many people, including Carl Jung, have already attempted to bridge this gap between psychology and religion. Now all this sounds great in theory, but what exactly are the limits of this psycho-religious solution? After all, we said earlier that mankind can't seem to escape the nature of our character. It is our ego and self-consciousness of our existence that brings about the dilemma in life. How could we possibly escape it? No matter how many of our fears we may transcend with our heroic strivings and psycho-spiritual practices, we cannot escape the structure of the mind that creates the problem in the first place. To escape the structure of the human mind, one would have to become a totally new being. Now some spiritual practices seem to claim exactly this, but they seem to fall short on that promise. The philosopher Paul Tillich understood the problem well and proposed the following answer to it. The only argument for the truth of this gospel of new being is that the message makes itself true. Or in other words, the spiritual attainment of a new state of being by a religious figure became essentially a myth. The mythological figure's path that they took to achieve this new being becomes the ideal that their followers could strive towards and in the process of striving towards that ideal, they could partially achieve it. The philosopher Suzanne Langer summed up this concept as the myth of the inner life. She explains that the word myth in this instance is not to imply that it is an illusion or a made-up story. Rather, some myths generate real conceptual power, real apprehension of a dim truth, a sort of universal truth that we miss with pure analytical reasoning. William James argued that beliefs about reality affect people's real actions. This in turn helps to introduce new things into the world. This is especially true for beliefs about man, human nature, and what a man might yet become. If a belief influences us to change the world, then to an extent, the belief itself is changing the world. However, this creative myth is not meant to be a relapse into comfortable illusion. It is a call to be bold and strive towards the ideal with the highest effort. This means that one needs the courage to stand on their own two feet and face up to all of life's problems. The courage to face the anxiety of meaninglessness. This is the bold goal of our cosmic heroism. To cast away all the illusions we comfortably live in and take as much of the world into us as we possibly can good and bad. It is only then that we can develop new forms of courage and endurance and serve as living proof that mankind can find meaning and inner peace despite all of the suffering caused by life itself. Even if psychology were to successfully bridge the gap between science and religion, that does not mean that it will replace religion and it doesn't mean that it will solve the life problem. Science and psychology have attempted to categorize and explain this sacred and mysterious urge towards cosmic heroism. Ultimately, they have fallen short in this explanation. However, they have become another outlet for man to act out his cosmic heroism. Perhaps that's the best we can hope for. Modern man is drinking, drugging, and shopping themselves out of awareness. 
because awareness calls for heroic paths that culture no longer provides. So society offers the next best thing, a way to forget. Alternatively, we bury ourselves in science or psychology under the mistaken belief that awareness in itself is some kind of magical cure to our problems. Perhaps the closest we can come to a solution is the creation of new outlets to act out our cosmic heroism. The key word being act. The heroism that will suffice calls for action. We must orient ourselves towards the highest possibility. Our goals must go beyond matters of the body and beyond mere belief. Instead, they must be grounded in immortality ideologies and myths of heroic transcendence.